Okay, so continuing uh, empiric use of antibiotics in small animals. We, we often say skin dermatology is what you'll see the most of, and that's true, but it's actually not the most prevalent disease. If you actually look at the, the uh, number of animals that have periodontal disease or gingivitis, they probably rank tops because we just don't brush their teeth or do dental hygiene typically. So a lot of dogs will come in with uh, oral lesions. Now it depends on the severity as to where, when you address it. So, uh, uh, but dental prophies and um, dental procedures are becoming increasingly common. Okay. And uh, I don't know if you can appreciate this um, particular slide. I'll just dim it momentarily. Uh, this was a poodle that was referred in for bleeding from the mouth. Here's my hand. This is the tip of the nose. And you can see all this extensive plaque and tartar uh, that's accumulated calculus on the, the gums. And uh, the bleeding from the mouth actually turned out to be the periodontal disease was so severe that uh, this canine, it had actually eroded into an artery and was spurting blood. So every once in a while it spurt arterial blood out of that lesion uh, and then it clot for a little while and then it spurt again. And the reason for that getting to this shape was regrettable. The dog had a heart murmur and because of that the referring veterinarian refused to anesthetize it to do any sort of dental prophy. And this is what we wound up with. Uh, I'll talk about medical management, but I wanted to make a, a couple of points here. Um, heart disease per se is not a contraindication for anesthesia. Yes, it raises your risk, okay? But this, we echoed it after we got it here, and it had valve disease and a pretty prominent murmur, but no arrhythmias and it wasn't in heart failure. We did go ahead and do anesthesia without uh, any complications, uh, but because it was so advanced, we had to remove nearly every tooth in the dog's head. Uh, and the bone reabsorption was so bad on the lower jaw, the, the, um, basically it just flopped down. There was no uh, mandible left for about half the jaw. Uh, and this is a case, owners are scared of anesthesia, but veterinarians shouldn't be. Um, we did anesthesia, you can do anesthesia. Yes, it increases the risk, but compared to what can occur, and I find that good dental hygiene, taking a dog with, with moderate to severe periodontal disease, is one of the best things you can do to improve their quality of life. It really makes a difference in some of these dogs in terms of how well they feel. Amazingly so, you wouldn't think it, but it, it does. So <laughs> we need, uh, need to do, uh, address this, and we do it oftentimes with dental procedures. But antibiotics are a part of those dental procedures. Now, if you look at what you can culture out of the mouth, just about anything, okay? Uh, and anytime you do a dental procedure, certainly extractions, but even cleanings, you create a bacteremia, okay? Uh, just dogs with moderate periodontal disease do a prophy. If they do blood cultures on them, most of those dogs will blood culture positive. So you're creating a bacteremia. I'll talk about uh, thoughts on that. But if in terms of actually the periodontal disease itself, it's the obligate anaerobic gram-negative bacteria here that are causing the periodontal disease. They're creating endotoxins uh, and other toxins that attack the periodontal ligament, cause bone reabsorption, et cetera. And here you see our good old bacteroides you don't have to know these. These are other obligate anaerobic gram negatives that are fairly unique to the mouth. But they are the, the ones that we target in terms of periodontal disease. Okay, 
So what do we use? Um, most of the time you use clavamox or clindamycin, truthfully. All right, clindamycin uh, is nice because it has an anaerobic spectra and is relatively lipid soluble compared to clavamox anyway. So it penetrates the tissues pretty well, it will uh, penetrate what they call the glycocalyx associated with the tartar buildup. So it, it does a pretty good job. And just for the periodontal disease standpoint, uh, this is a, a really good drug to use. Now, I use Clavamox, but I, use, I can use it for the periodontal disease, and it's not bad, okay? But where I really use it more commonly is to address the bacteremia, okay? So when we're doing these procedures, we're creating a bacteremia. Is that a problem? Uh, it depends on the severity of the bacteremia and particularly if there's any underlying predilection to those bacteria seeding in the body. If they're diabetic, if they're cushionoid, if they're on immunosuppressives, if the dog has endocardiosis and valve lesions, not endocarditis yet, just valve lesions, all those tend to set the stage for those bacteria to seed really easily. And so you can take a dog that you do a routine procedure on and you wind up with an endocarditis, a pyelonephritis, septic arthritis, these sorts of things. So it's really common to add an antibiotic prophylactically to address the bacteremia so we don't wind up with subsequent sequelae that we have to do. And Clavamox is, is probably the one that we use uh, most commonly. Now, we follow kind of the same rules for uh, dental procedures as we do for surgery. And that is, it is most important to have the antibiotic on board before you do the procedure, okay? <clears throat> so, uh, that's the fewest number of bacteria, so therefore we have fewer inactivating enzymes, okay? And also, if we're doing extractions, this sort of thing, it's a whole lot easier to have the antibiotic on board and incorporated through the blood into the clot than trying to diffuse it into the clot afterwards. So we try to have it on board. And typically these I'll do like two hours before, if this is oral, I'll do like two hours before uh, we actually do the procedure. And that's about when the, the clavamox is peaking. You have other things that you can use uh, but uh, for the bacteremia aspect, you want four quadrant because although the gram-negative obligate anaerobes are the main cause of periodontal disease, what I showed you before, you can get anything, aerobes, anaerobes, uh, facultative anaerobes in the bacteremia mix. All right, so that's why we use more of this. How long we do it again, we, uh, we tend to mimic a surgery and we know that having it on board at the, uh, before the procedure uh, and the first six hours after are the most critical, okay? <laughs> so there are some veterinarians that will do single dose antibiotic prophylaxis. They'll take a fairly high dose of amoxicillin or clavamox and give it before the procedure and that's all. Um, I tended to go a day or two after. Now again, extrapolating, going beyond two days from a prophylaxis standpoint is not warranted. You would have treated anything, prevented anything you're going to treat, and you'd only promote resistance. So I tended to do it uh, two hours before and then for two days. Uh, but arguably, I wouldn't say you're wrong if you just give the single large dose uh, beforehand. Now that's different than treating the periodontal disease. This is just the bacteremia I'm talking about. Now treating the periodontal disease, we'll put them on uh, uh, beforehand and then continue for, depends on the severity, uh, two weeks say on average, maybe longer if it's more severe. Speaking of more severe, uh, some of these are really, really nasty like the one I showed you. And if we can, we'd rather put them on antibiotics in these uh, a week or two before we do the dental procedure. So we can knock back some of that infection and inflammation before we do the procedure. And here, these are legitimate, but a lot of people will add metronidazole to clavamox. Metronidazole is great for these anaerobes and it's very lipid soluble. It penetrates everywhere. 
So this is a very good addition on the more severe infections where we're trying to get it under control before we do the procedure so we produce less uh, bacteremia. Another good uh, addition is doxycycline sustained release gel. Uh, we use this in the periodontal pockets. So when we've got ongoing periodontal disease, we'll have the gums, the gingiva separate away from the tooth, exposing the root, this sort of thing. And getting those dealt with can be somewhat problematic. Uh, Doxyrobe uh, is doxycycline in one syringe and a polymer in a second syringe. You put a neat little connector between the two syringes and you just push them back and forth to mix them and that activates it. <clears throat> then you put a blunt needle on the syringe and just uh, inject the uh, gel into that pocket. Not into the tissues, this is a blunt needle, but, but just lay it down in that pocket. It kind of fills up the pocket, it semi-solidifies, and you get really high concentrations that are going to overcome a lot of resistance that regular plasma concentrations couldn't uh, achieve. And remember, the tetracyclines have an anti-collagenase activity. So they'll uh, inhibit some of the collagenase involved with that periodontal ligament breakdown. So these are our kind of our, our common go-to um, antibiotics. Now, a couple of other things I wanted to mention. There is, uh, again, the chlorhexidinal, chlorhexidine dental rinse. That is a nice adjuvant uh, to this. So uh, uh, especially the, the ones with active periodontal disease, adding chlorhexidine dental rinse to the antibiotics is always a good idea. The chlorhexidine has, again, an affinity for the enamel and for the gums so that it binds and has a sustained effect beyond uh, just its uh, presence in the mouth. So that's always a good addition if the animal will tolerate it. Uh, again, use the actual dental product rather than making it up as an, uh, from your gallon jug of disinfectant because it tastes terrible and the dental rinses have been manipulated to try to minimize that taste. Now, uh, there are on um, rare occasions, I told you about this dog with heart disease that it was safe to do the <coughs> anesthesia on. In 35 years, I have seen maybe two dogs where anesthesia said no. Uh, those dogs were throwing ventricular arrhythmias right and left, okay? That was not the problem. Not so much heart failure per se, uh, but just severe ventricular arrhythmias. Now, in those dogs, we did what is called pulse therapy, all right? So if you've got the animal that it's, you can't do the anesthesia to do the prophy, which is the main thing. If you can't do that, we'll use pulse therapy antibiotics. And that's basically taking one of these antibiotics, I used Clavamox, uh, and putting the animal through a two week course roughly of antibiotics. That will knock down the infection, uh, decrease the inflammation, and if not making it subclinical, it at least makes it more bearable for the animal, improves the quality of life. And so we do uh, two weeks of a course of antibiotics, uh, use the chlorhexidine, and then we realize that in a variable length of time, often two or three months later, we'll have to pulse them again. So we put them through another course of antibiotics. So we're periodically hitting them with a pulse of antibiotic therapy, okay, to keep the disease under control. Will you develop resistance? Probably. But uh, most of these animals, if they have that much heart disease, uh, they typically will die from other things before resistance gets to be a problem. Uh, these are, are relatively guarded prognoses in terms of length of life uh, anyway. So pulse therapy is something that you can do in addition to the chlorhexidine to help some of these that you cannot uh, anesthetize. And by the way, uh, they'll teach you, when, when you get out and uh, one of the things I've noticed that a lot of veterinarians do is they'll tell the owner that they need to brush the dog's teeth 
They'll even uh, dispense toothpaste and uh, toothbrushes for them. But if you will show, if you will demonstrate to the owner how it's done, that goes a long way in convincing them that it, you can do it. I mean, truthfully, if most owners, you say, brush their teeth, the owners are going to go, yeah, right. Okay. So if you actually show them, and most, you can do it. Okay. If they can't do it and periodontal disease is uh, becoming a problem again, the chlorhexidine dental rinse is a good alternative to cut down on the buildup of the plaque and progressing disease. So any questions on periodontal disease or oral dental? Okay. Otitis. Um, you will deal with a lot of uh, ear problems. Otitis external mainly, sometimes media or internum. Again, I wanted to make a point. Uh, in humans, we have just a horizontal canal. We come more or less straight out from the eardrum. Uh, dogs don't. Dogs have a vertical canal turning into a horizontal canal. So uh, this vertical canal uh, prevents drainage, so they're more prone to retain exudate. Uh, and uh, I think I mentioned to you my own dog where we did a lateral <coughs> wall resection, a uh, referring vet for the Humane Society, so that we wind up with an external canal. But anyway, uh, my point in saying this is, again, when you go down to community practice, you're going to be seeing a lot of normal dogs and cats. And do not leave that rotation until you feel comfortable visualizing an eardrum. It sounds simple, it is not, okay? It takes a little practice. You've got to put your cone down vertically and it's going to bump into this uh, wall, so then you have to turn it horizontally to see the eardrum, all right? And that's going to be important because, as you'll see in just a moment, if that eardrum is not intact, we have certain otics that we do not use mainly the aminoglycosides. So, uh, and also you need to visualize the eardrum to see if they have an otitis media. So um, when I was in charge of community practice, now community veterinary services, that was a requirement that each student uh, uh, show to a clinician an eardrum, show that they can visualize an eardrum. Okay. So what do you got? Well, you don't have anaerobes, that's good at least. Uh, but you can have any of these gram positives or gram negatives. Pseudomonas gets a lot of press because it's kind of the baddie, uh, mostly resistant. But all these things, often in combination with yeast, we very, very commonly see mixed yeast bacterial otitis. Okay. Uh, and here I've kind of divided the, we mostly treat topically with otics. Uh, I'll mention systemics in just a moment for rare cases. But, uh, and, and oh, before I leave that, remember most recurring otitis is due to allergies, either atopy or food allergies. So if you get one that keeps coming back for recurrent infections, address allergies with them. It makes a huge difference. Okay. So, if you've got uh, intact uh, eardrums, then we can use uh, an aminoglycoside. Uh, Genomycin is an Otomax. There's one downstairs. Bominimax is the same thing as Otomax, but it has a different steroid. Instead of uh, betamethasone, it has uh, momenicin. Uh, <clears throat> Ocernia is approved with, uh, for intact eardrums. It's fluorophenicol, again, uh, an antifungal and a steroid. Now, one thing, uh, the Otomax, the Genomycin will get a Pseudomonas, the fluorophenicol will not. So if you uh, think you have Pseudomonas, you need to use something other than Ocernia. Now, Ocernia has uh, a really neat key feature, though. Most of these uh, otics are going to be at least BID administration. Ocernia comes as a sustained release gel for the ear. 
It supposedly produces a one week of effective concentrations in the ear. And you can repeat that so that you, uh, one time according to label, so you get two weeks from two applications, which is very, very nice from owner compliance standpoint. Now again, anytime you treat an otitis externa, you need a clean ear canal. That will dramatically improve your success. And that can be anywhere from uh, mild cases, putting the cleaner in, rubbing it around, using a uh, cotton swab to dab it out, more commonly flushing it with a uh, bulb syringe, or worst case scenario again, uh, anesthetizing them and cleaning it. Uh, I think there's another fluorophenicol product out that does similar things. Now, if you're dealing with a ruptured eardrum, or you can't tell, if, you, if it's so swollen that you can't get down there and see, you need to presume it's ruptured, okay, and treat it accordingly, all right? Uh, now, none of these things have labels for use in ruptured eardrum, but practice and experience has uh, taught us that we believe them to be safe. Uh, silver sulfadiazine is one I used a lot of. Uh, <clears throat> it uh, related to it is batrol otic. Batrol otic is silver sulfadiazine and enrofloxacin. Okay. Um, the um, the enrofloxacin is the antibacterial. The silver sulfadiazine is antibacterial, antifungal. It does hold the yeast in check, and that's really probably why it's in vitral otic, is to control the yeast that tends to overgrow. So this is real good. Now truthfully, I hated to waste vitral on a routine otitis, so I would compound, or get the pharmacy to compound just the silver sulfadiazine. And uh, they would t order powder and make it up as a suspension uh, clinicians will order the sylvadine cream, cut it 50% with sterile water, not saline, but sterile water. Makes kind of an ointment that you, you can uh, then uh, drop into the ear. Again, this is a suspension, not a solution, so you need a really clean ear because it will not penetrate debris very well. Uh, others, uh, Posatex is orbifloxacin, steroid, posaconazole is our antifungal. It seems safe. The worst ones, based on culture and sensitivity, uh, when all of these others are resistant, will do timentin, which is a ticarcillin. Um, um, I can't remember if it's clavulanic acid or not, uh, <coughs> but it's a potentiated penicillin, uh, often combined with Tris EDTA. Tris is a buffer EDTA, chelates the divalent cations, making the bacterial cell membrane really leaky, so it uh, improves the activity of the antibiotic. And what you can do, this is compounded, you take your injectable timentin uh, <coughs> and mix it with the Tris EDTA, pull it up into syringes and then freeze it. They've shown it is stable frozen. So uh, you send home so many syringes with the owner and keep back the frozen part uh, and dispense it as needed. So these are all topicals, what's uh, appropriate for the intact versus the ruptured. Now again, back to those ongoing problem children with recurrent otitis. Again, address allergies, that's a huge thing. But one of the things I would tend to do is use acidifying solutions. Again, big problems are yeast and pseudomonas, and both of those don't like acid environments. So after I got the initial otitis under control with something up here, I would put them on a maintenance acidifying solution, where uh, beginning about, uh, I'd have them use it about three times a week. If that was kept under control, maybe go to twice a week, something like that. Uh, and various uh, preps are available. Uh, Maliseic otic is a good one, but it can be just uh, uh, vinegar and water. Uh, one third uh, white vinegar and two thirds water. You'll probably use the malastetic otic, this sort of thing, but if they won't pay for it, 
Uh, you can certainly use anything that acidifies that local environment. All right. <clears throat> now, systemic therapy is only warranted for an otitis if it's severe or it's a media, otitis media. And for that, you need to uh, consider doing a myringotomy. So you look at that eardrum and you see a, a fluid line behind it. All right, so there's fluid behind the eardrum. That means there's an otitis media. All right, <clears throat> you need to drain that eardrum. You need to rupture the eardrum, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and contrary to what your mother told you, the eardrum does grow back. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, if you look at an eardrum, and if, it should be nice and clear where you can actually see the middle ear bones, the anvil and all that behind it. But on one corner, I can't remember which side, you'll see a little pink epithelium. Uh, that's the germinal epithelium. That's what generates the eardrum. Uh, as long as this is intact, the eardrum will grow back in about two weeks. So what I would do is I anesthetize the animal, I use a sterile otoscopic cone, and I would use a spinal needle. I'd run it down there, and I'd just touch it to the eardrum, and it immediately uh, dissolves. And that lets the fluid drain away, and it's also an excellent time to go ahead and get a nice culture, because that's relatively pure culture uh, at this point and uh, <clears throat> then you can base it off culture and sensitivity. But a myringotomy is just the scientific or medical term for uh, lancing the eardrum or rupturing the eardrum intentionally. All right, so again, we base it off culture and sensitivity since we've gone to the trouble to do the anesthesia anyway. But in the meantime, while we're waiting, a whole variety of things will work. Uh, it just has to be aimed at gram positives and gram negatives. The staph, uh, not necessarily pseudomonas unless you have reason to suspect it based on smell, et cetera, or prior history. Uh, but we're uh, in rifloxacin, clavamox, all these sorts of things. And if uh, yeast is involved, we can put them on systemic azole therapy. 